Welcome back to Spirit Music Meetups. Mike Burris here. Well, we're on part two of this blog uh, topic, log, Logos water, Word of God. <coughs> so, Logos Word of God, blog topic 12. Scripture was elementary ABCs for Jews as children, slaves, and prisoners, but only until Christ. And now we're, you want to see blog, the uh, part one, because that really set the stage for what we're going to talk about now. And we've been walk, uh, going through all these verses by Paul that talk about the Stokian, which are the uh, elementary or rudimental ABCs, you know, for little children. It's how they learn, right? How little children learn, right? The ABCs. It's the fundamentals. It's the principles. And we've heard some pretty negative things already about this. So you want to watch blog, uh, the first part, right, of this blog. Now we're going to look at Galatians, we're going through this Galatians 2, and we've looked uh, through several verses already from Galatians 2, and this is now we're on Galatians 2.20, but we're going to do something a little bit before we do that, and you know from all my videos, it's, it's called Getting in the Flow of the Holy Spirit, and I kind of just got in the door... <laughs> And you can tell I'm a little disjointed, so I need to get into the flow of the Holy Spirit before we get into all these details. So, Lord, I just ask you for the flow of the Holy Spirit to come. We draw near to you. We come close to you. We are coming close to you now. The Holy Spirit is within us. And so we're at the mouth, your mouth, right? The mouth of the river. And waiting for the river to show us, to speak to us, and for us to feel you. So we're here to see, to hear, and feel. The prophetic rhema word of God. We're here for the prophetic rhema word of God. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Yeah, I needed that. I needed that. All righty, Lord, I'm ready now. Now I'm ready. So now Paul really drives the point home in Galatians 2.20 through 23. So watch part one. If you already have died or away. Now who's, he who's we or you? <laughs> it's these Gentile Christians. It's Gentile, I'm sorry, it's not Gentile Christians, it's Jewish Christians in Galatians. Got to know your audience. Always read who he's writing this to. Look at the words that he uses. They're all Jewish words. They're Jewish issues. Um, and these are Christians that have come out of Judaism. And they're being dragged back in to Judaism by teachers of the law. And they are false teachers. Right? Everything is false. That's what Paul's trying to explain Compared to the gospel, even if it's the old covenant, it is no longer the current covenant. And so it is the false teaching of God to go back to Moses. It is the false teaching. I don't know if people realize this. Paul is saying, no, this is false teaching. It was the covenant of God with his people, but no longer. I don't know how many times he said, no longer. If you already have died away from right? Something, all right? Died away from something. That's apathenesco, uh, to die away from something together with, this is together with Christ. And he talks about where that happens. Water baptism. If you haven't been water baptized, you aren't saved. He says you are saved in water baptism when you are together with Christ in his death. 
and in his burial, and then in his resurrection. You're not with Christ in the resurrection until you have been buried with Christ, until you have died with Christ on the cross together with him. And this is how you die away from something. And we're going to find out what that something is. Together with Christ, away from, here it is, the something. The Stokian elementary or rudimental ABC fundamental principles. What are those? He tells you what they are right now. He's been telling you all along. Of or belonging to the world. He's talking the Old Testament is part of the world. Why? Because it's no longer part of Christ. I don't know how people can not get this, but he's saying, like, if you're not part of Christ, if you're not, if this is not part of the new covenant in Christ, it is part of the world. And every religion of the world has these, right? Then why, as if you routinely, habitually, were really living, right? We're actually living in the world. All right? Really, genuinely. It's the word zao, uh, genuinely. You're, just, you're, really, you're, you're acting like you're really still living in this world. Presently, why are you presently ongoingly dogmatizo? This is the verb form of dogma, which is why are you submitting? Why do you submit to dogma? Is that a bad thing? Yes. <laughs> what is dogma? It's authoritative universally binding doctrines, precepts, decrees from God, laws, and ordinances. These are all decrees, and I'll tell you more about that on a note. So you want to go out to the page because all the notes are out there. In possibility not, you should handle. Okay, what are these? So he summarizes. Oh, don't handle. Uh, don't taste, don't touch, and these are all things that have been prescribed, precepts, they've all been prescribed, they've all been commanded, they're all decrees, they're all ordinances, they're all doctrines, they're all commandments, right? They're all commandments, right? Right there, A law of commandments and ordinances, right? So that's that's the key. They're universally binding interlay commandments of doctrines, precepts, decrees, laws, and ordinances. And there's so many verses on this, uh, you can't get around. That's dogma. And I have a whole page on commandments if you really want to see about this universally Binding commandments. And it's all about what you're not supposed to handle, what you're not supposed to taste. And this is like what you teach little kids. Don't touch this. Don't taste this. Don't handle this. Okay, so you get it. Little kid stuff. Impossibility not to do this. And which, he says, presently, ongoingly, are defined as, or exist as, all. What are all these things for? Toward and reaching the goal or purpose of, what were they all there for? This pathora, which is, they are all deteriorating. They are, the, the whole purpose of this, or the goal is for them to deteriorate, to decay, to rot, by the means of their own use. In other words, they were intended to end. They were intended to wind down. This is the purpose of them. Uh, they weren't intended to go forever. They were intended to be used up. And it's maybe really obscured in your English Bible. Go look at Bible Info. 900 English Bibles. But that's what it says. Which presently, ongoingly, are defined or exist, all of these, toward and reaching the goal or purpose of deterioration, decay, or rot. By the means of their use. Down from, where do they come down from? Or according to, entelma, the result of following Old Testament entele commandments to the end, right? Following them to the end. So that's, what, that, that's why they're going to rot. 
That's why they're going to fall, finally fall apart. That's why they're going to deteriorate, because they weren't meant to last forever. And this is all happening down from the result. It's the result of following Old Testament entelay, universally binding commandments to the end. So I want you to see universally binding commandments to the end. That's, that's what happens. <laughs> that was the intended purpose of them. And coupled to this, not, you know, commandments by themselves, right? But somebody has to teach them. <laughs> and Moses to the Aaron, Aaron's sons to the Levite priests, the Levite priests to the men of every tribe, and it goes from the greatest to the least. But go look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34. The new covenant is absolutely not like in any way, shape, or form like the old covenant. It goes from the least to the greatest. And there is no more teaching. It says it very clear. No more teaching. And it says, and coupled teachings of or belonging to men. Yes, guess what? It's men that had to teach these commandments of God and in every religion which presently ongoingly are defined or as exist as a Logos message. Oh, yeah, that's the Logos. Look at it. The Logos message was the Old Testament commandments and all the teachings of them. It says that very clear on my Logos message page, as we've been on. And it says, uh, as a Logos message is affirmed as, okay, they were affirmed, yes, they were affirmed as, Absolutely, from for 1,500 years, they were affirmed as, by all these rabbis and scribes, routinely, habitually, holding to have, all right, this is what they have, they're holding on to this, and, and so that holding on to have, of or belonging to wisdom. Yes, we were told in the Logos message of the Old Testament writings, there's lots of wisdom, yeah, and we've been told that for 1,500 years, but Actually, all religions tell you that. Think about it. Uh, every one of them. The, the, the Mormons have their book. The Quran, the Mo Islam, Mo the Muslims have their book. Uh, the Buddhists have their book. They all have a book. And it's these fundamental principles. This rote teaching of like, like we're all little kids that have to have our hand held. Telling us, you know, writing everything down for us. That's what Paul says. It's for little children. And even for the Jews. Claiming to have wisdom by the means of, and he lists out three things. But actually, the first thing encompasses the second and third. The first thing encompasses the second and third. It's the way it's written. The first thing is this really long word, which means self-desired or willed. Right? This is pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. I'm determined. It's self-desired or self-willed religion. That's what it is. Literally means that. Via, uh, you know, uh, services, liturgical rituals, and religious disciplines. Right? That's liturgical. You know what that is. Liturgy. Uh, and rituals, services and rituals. So there's all these rituals and services in every religion. Catholicism has a ton of them. Boy, oh boy, are they into rituals. I, was, I grew up in that stuff. And um, also, Buddhism and, I mean, now, oh my goodness. Every religion has these very ornate, elongated rituals. Service every pagan religion as well. And religious disciplines, right, for holiness. And so there's a holiness page for and godliness. So they they have this desire to be holy or righteous and godliness, right? What however they uh, however they translate that for righteous, holiness and godliness. And subsequently, all right, so here's number two and three. And subsequently, that's that's the Greek conjunction, Kai. Self-humbling or dis or dis um, sorry, depreciating practices like fasting. We already saw that word uh, used by Paul earlier, so he's just coming back to that same idea. So you want to go look at part one. 
and that was in it was in Galatians 2, maybe 17. So he talks about this already. So he's coming back to the same idea, which was written to Jewish Christians. And he says, okay, so this self-desired will, willed religion via these services and liturgies and disciplines for righteous holiness and godliness um, is subsequently fleshed out, expressed by self-humbling or depreciating practices like fasting. Yeah, it's like, oh, we got to beat our bodies, right? We got to beat our bodies. We got to flagellate us. We got to fast. And so there's a lot of fasting in every religion, cults of the world, um, and Judaism, uh, the oral traditions of the Jews have talked a lot about fasting. Jesus talks about how they're fasting and showing that they're in great suffering and it makes them feel good and it makes other people think, oh, how holy they are. And so you still see this to this day. But you notice that Jesus never fasted. And, there's, and we talked about that in part uh, one. Why? Why he, he didn't fast and neither did his disciples. And he explains why. So go look at that. And number three, he connects to this, coupled and coupled to this. So that's why two and three are coupled together, a coupler. Very related to this is this other Greek word, which means unsparing severity to, of the body to create self-depreciating practices. Like, I'm sorry, uh, severity of the body to create self-control. To create self-control, right? The self-control. And what is that? That uh, self-control for? For righteous holiness and godliness. So it comes all the way back to the same idea. See, that's, that's why they're doing this. Self-control for righteousness, holiness, godliness. Right? So it's the same idea. That's why two and three are connected. And it's definitely connected to number one. That had the same, same definition, basically. And he says, ooh, that's the emphasis, absolutely, in fact, not with. He's, he's telling us these things, number one, two, and three, absolutely, in fact, not with time, proceed, value, or worth. They are not. They are not, right? They are not with proceed, value, or time. So we can insert they are not, but you can you'll see that he's telling you this. They are not absolutely in fact with time, time was his Greek word meaning proceed value or worth. Then he uses this other Greek word meaning this, this. It's like wow, it's way out of position. You're like, why is the this therefore? <laughs> because you'll see why. He says this, that stuff number one, two, and three. So. It's, it's a pronoun, indefinite pronoun, saying, hey, you know what I just talked about, number one, two, and three? This self-willed religion that con consists of these two points. This, toward and reaching or accomplishing the, now, what is the, 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 therefore, indulgence or satisfaction of the flesh? So, in the context, it's the discipline to create self-control over the indulgence of the flesh. So that's why the this is there for, <laughs> this is why the this is there. It's to say, hey, I'm going to summarize here for you. He's saying it absolutely does not have any ability to create self-control. It does not have any ability to self create self-control, to create self-control over the indulgence or satisfaction of the flesh. I know it appears to be wise. So some of your Bibles will say it appears to be wise. Um, but it doesn't. That's the problem. But it doesn't accomplish what it was set out to do. It didn't stop the indulgence or satisfaction of the flesh. We're going to see why. But this is what's in every religion. It's, in, it's the fundamentals of every religion. It's the fundamentals of every religion. So here's some notes here <clears throat> that we talked about you want to look at. When I said dogma, we, we listed everything in the Old Testament, 
but it's what's in every single writing out there from every single religious book. It's the same thing, climbing up little rungs. Here's a little game for you children, hopscotch. If you jump in this order, if you jump through these hoops, if you do this and if you do that and if you do this, they're called works of the law. Well, hey, this is part of every single religion. If you do this and then you do this and, and you say this in a certain order, a little incantation, a little mantra, and then you do some backflips, I mean, it's crazy what you see in every single religion of the world. Absolutely. So there's a lot negative written about dogma. So I list a bunch, four scriptures there for you. And there's only one place that it speaks about it positively. So you can go look at that. Now, <clears throat> when I talked, a Logos message talks about, hey, they, the, the, these things, they have a Logos message, right? Taught by men, and it's affirmed by men. Hey, they've affirmed this. Doesn't mean the Logos message has to be true. It doesn't mean that there is actually wisdom, a Logos message of or belonging to wisdom, because in some cases, like Matthew 28, 13, and 15, you can see that this is a pre, uh, it's a supposition, but it's proved to be false. It's not an accurate Logos message. So that's Paul's statement really here is, yeah, it appears to be wise or the message has been affirmed to be of or belonging to wisdom, but guess what? It didn't solve the problem. So I guess it wasn't wise. The problem of the indulgence of the flesh is still there. No matter how many hoops you jump through, it didn't fix the problem. And so many believe here this reputation of excellence is unmerited, as scholars Lightfoot and Liddell Scott note. So other scholars can see this as well, that this reputation, this affirmation of excellence is unmerited. That seems the case because Paul's argument is that it actually absolutely, in fact, is of no certain uh, annual um, honor or value. That it actually is of absolutely no certain honor or value. So, hey, it looked like it was valuable, but didn't turn out to be valuable. So, here's another note that when you see this connector, this conjunction called chi, it often couples two things together, as likely the case with number two and three, the severity of the body and this self-humiliation. So we see those connected aptly, and which is the emphasis, uh, which is the emphasis of the repetition of similar words. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped. It's like the likely case um, as obviously being related, number two and three are obviously being related. But number one, right, this self-willed or desire, desired, strongly desired um, self-willed religion, this is the broader category that contains the number two and three elements, which is the emphasis, right, which is the emphasis uh, due to the repetition of similar words. So you see, that is the emphasis. You see the repetition of these words. And that's how you know it's the emphasis. You keep seeing the same words being repeated. That is the emphasis. So, <clears throat> number, uh, note D is important. This word, this, I said, I really stands out because this the Greek word tina, is an indefinite pronoun. So it's, it's referring to number one, two, and three. It moved quite a bit out of place, um, out of position in the sentence to place the emphasis. It was moved quite a bit out of place in the phrase to instead place the emphasis on ook. So whatever's in the beginning of the sentence would have got the emphasis. This, right, is absolutely not, in fact, this is absolutely not, in fact, of value. He could have said that. And then this, obviously, is right there, right after talking about number one, two, and three. 
but he moved it out of place because he wanted to put the emphasis on absolutely, in fact, not. <laughs> That's the place, right, in the phrase, to instead place the emphasis on absolutely, in fact, not. So it's just saying, hey, you know, they can move words out of the way to place the emphasis on something else. That's what Paul did. Hey, he's saying, hey, this is absolutely not. <laughs> Don't even go there. It's in the data feminine singular, which maps up, matches up to the nouns of number one, two, and three. So this, right, is referring to a self-willed religion of two coupled bodily di disciplines, right? Two coupled bodily disciplines. Uh, disciplines of righteousness. That's what it is. Two coupled body disciplines of righteousness. Trying to achieve, right, the self-desired willful religion. That despite their affirmed message of wisdom and thus perceived value, actually are absolutely in fact not with perceived value or worth toward accomplishing self-control over the indulgence of the flesh. And that's Paul's real message. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The Old Testament Logos message that the law of commandments, right? That was the message, the Old Testament, the law of commandments and follow-up oral law traditions of the elders indeed have been affirmed by Jews for a long time to be of or belonging to wisdom. And in this particular case, in applying the might and power, external resources, and internal abilities of man in Zechariah 4, 6, under the Old Covenant. And you got to understand that that whole text there is talking about the Old Covenant moving into the New Covenant. To developing self-control over the indulgence of the flesh. Trying to get control over the flesh through many disciplines of the body, as with various types of fasting, but, which is asceticism. But Paul says it's ultimately all non-productive. It's all ultimately non-productive. And you can't get across that emphasis of all, is all. Zechariah 4, 6, the solution is by the means of my spirit. That's what it talks about of the completely different in kind, Chadash or Kainos, New Covenant. That's Paul's solution also in Colossians 1.9. So you want to look at, Paul has talked about this before, earlier. So everything's in context, you know that? Text without a context is a pretext for a proof text, so we can't read things out of context. He's already talked about this wisdom he calls it a spirit a kind of wisdom, pneumatikos, it's an adjective. The spirit kind of wisdom and coupled connect the dots understanding that is the means of being filled to the full. It is the means or an instrument. That's the word means or instrument of being filled. The spirit is. Right, of wisdom and understanding is the means of being filled to the full. You want to get full, you got to get the spirit of wisdom and understanding by the means. So it just doesn't happen out of thin air. No, it happens by the means of epinosis, genuine, full, experiential, relational knowledge. See, that's relational. This is not head knowledge, has nothing to do with reading Bible scriptures. And it's a special kind of knowledge, I have a page for this, of God's will. It's not the self-desired, willed religion of the Old Testament, or a law, or any other Gentile philosophy or religion, right? Any other world religion that will work. Everything comes... Right from the dunamis, which is dynamite, where we get dynamite, dunamis like enabling power of the Holy Spirit of Christ, who is the head. He is who is the only head. It says he's the only head per Colossians 1 11, 29. 
and 2.12. And that head and that power gives life to every part of the body. Only one head and that power from the head is what gives life. Nothing else. You see, genuine life never gives life to anything, right? That's why Jesus and his disciples didn't fast even through, even though, I'm sorry, even though the disciples of John the Baptist and every other rabbi there has ever been did. We saw the reasons why in note C above, and I read those for Galatians 2, 16 and 18. And <clears throat> if you look at the word life, and you look at how many times he talks about this in Galatians, you, you see that's it's all the life comes from the Spirit. And so life, genuine life. And so, it, even though they say there's life in the scripture, Old Testament scriptures, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When life, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So the emphasis is on Christ, 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 and that's why the book of Hebrews. This is a different writing. Similarly says, and, and a lot of people think it's Paul, but Paul writes in a very crude, um, very kind of cryptic Greek. And uh, a more classically uh, type of Greek is the book of Hebrews. So it's very doubtful unless he had somebody writing it for him. But he traveled with Barnabas, who had classical Greek um, training. And so it's likely Barnabas, because they preached right next to each other. The same messages over and over and over. So it sounds like Paul, but it's likely Barnabas. Or he could have had Barnabas write it for him. So either way, he's the author. That's why the book of Hebrews similarly says, For the reason that the law routinely, habitually, is holding to have a shadow, outline, or sketch. Again, we see that that's the entire law. The law is just a shadow of the routinely, habitually, about to happen, agathos, God-like good, upright, honorable, excellent, beneficial, useful, or praiseworthy things, absolutely, in fact, not themselves. All right? So the Old Testament, absolutely <clears throat> not, in fact, themselves, <clears throat> these things, <clears throat> these God-like, but they're pointing forward to it. They're a shadow of the things. You know, shadow is just, you know, here's the sun, hits a statue, creates a shadow. It's not, right? The godlike things that were about to happen were not the shadow. That's what it says. And they were not the icon where it's a prototype image, the statue, or bust of, so it's not the thing creating the shadow, right? Of the regularly, habitually practiced deeds. So, the bust, the figure, and it says earlier, we saw in part one, it's Christ. Christ is the bust, the prototype image, the prototype image. There's only one image. The prototype image who cast a shadow backwards into the Old Testament. And we saw that in the previous verses of Paul talking about. And he says, hey, it's... The bust is not these things, the regularly, habitually practiced deeds, which are sacrifices each year. Absolutely, in fact, not ever. They are presently, ongoingly, dynamite-like, powerful enough to make, mature, complete, or perfect them who are routinely, habitually coming from one place to close beside God. For it, and so what is that? That is worship. That's prayerful worship, this pro circumai coming close uh, from one place to another. They're na not able to mature or make mature or complete or perfect them. These things that they're doing every single year, every single week, every single day. For the law, absolutely, in fact, no thing was made mature, complete, or perfect. So... And so that's what we have. 
So we have Hebrews 10.1 is regards regarding prayerful worship in approaching God. And so it was never able to make these people perfect, right? Never able to make them perfect. So I have a prayer page so you can see how all that relates. And they're approaching to God. It never, never worked for them. And then it says, the, the law absolutely in fact, no thing was made uh, mature, complete, or perfect. In other words, the law failed miserably. Therefore, Paul declares the law or principle, it's just the general namas, just means the principle or rule, principle rule. That's what namas means. The principle rule of or belonging to the spirit of Zoe, genuine life, in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of, of sin and coupled death. And guess what? That's the Mosaic Law. In context, very clearly talking about the Mosaic Law of sin. <laughs> the law is of or belonging to sin and of or belonging to death. So that's 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 bad news, man. Of or belonging to sin and of or belonging to death. So th this is not good. That's the law of sin, of or belonging to sin, right? And of death. For the reason that the powerlessness of or belonging to the law, there's a powerlessness, in that it was weak, infirm, without vigor or strength, depleted, lacking in necessary results, insufficient, frail, and sick. That's the problem with the law. It's powerless. And this tells you why. Through the realizing channel of the flesh. Paul says, the flesh, Jesus says, the flesh is all those things, weak, infirm, without vigor. So that's the problem. God sent his son, <clears throat> his son, Jesus, to condemn sin in the flesh. That's why God sent him. He needs to get rid of the flesh. He needs to get rid of sin, and he needs to get rid of sin in the flesh. The gospel logos message of the Spirit's dynamite-like enabling power is not... The Logos message of the law. Right? The gospel is not the law. The first is God acting for the sake of man. That's what the gospel Logos message is. God acting for the sake of man. And the second is man acting for the sake of God. See that? The first is Christ's obedient work. Yes, he had an obedience an obedient work on the cross, giving us Christ's righteousness by grace through our faith. By grace. And you know what? That's unconditional, loving favor of grace. That's what grace means. Unconditional, loving favor of grace. So I have a page on that so you can see that. And it's through our trusting, relying faith. And it's always this dia, through the realizing channel. We keep seeing this all the way through. We keep say, seeing this through the realizing channel. Dia, through the realizing channel. This is how it all happens. You know, there's one way to get from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle. It's called the diameter, dia. It's a preposition in Greek. So we get our word diameter from that. So this is important. <laughs> How does unconditional love get to us? It goes from the, here, from God, through the circle of trusting, relying faith, from here to us, through our trusting, relying faith. It makes the connection. Isn't that beautiful picture? They're really into word pictures. And all lost in your English translation. And the second, which is the law, is our works of righteousness to earn, right, God's favor. To earn, right, or deserve. 
So that's the difference by one is unearned and undeserved unconditional loving favor of grace. So opposites, they're opposites. So Hebrews 5.11 through 14 really blasts Jewish Christian thinking about going back to obeying the Old Testament scriptures. Quote, you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, right, Christian teachers, they ought to be Christian teachers. That's what they should be. You need someone to teach you again. The Stokian elementary or rudimental ABC fundamental principles of or belonging to, now he didn't say the world this time. Listen to what he says. Of or belonging to the RK, first in time or importance, their first in time or importance, of or belonging to the Logion, prophetic oracles or utterances of God. So he didn't tack he didn't tack this on to the world of the world, but it's related. You'll see why. But he says, first, the first important, right? What was the first most important in time or importance? In this case, it's importance. Of or belonging to the Logion prophetic utterances or oracles of God. This is the prophets, the old, but it's also all through every. You know, in, the, in Psalms, that's in the book of the writings. Uh, in the Song of Solomons, that's in the book, the, the portion called the writings. That's prophetic. He says, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the Logos message of righteousness. Is he talking about the Old Testament Logos message of righteousness? No, he's talking about the gospel. You'll see why. Since he is an infant child, but solid food is for the mature, complete, or perfect. Same word that the law could not do. Made no one mature, complete, or perfect. For those who have their enabling powers of discernment, gymnastically trained. That's where we get gymnasium. By constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Is this reading writings? No. That's the milk. <laughs> the context is, hey, having this all written out for you is milk. It's all milk. All these uh, foremost things. And we'll talk about what those are. The foremost things. And Paul says that discernment is a progressive grace gift of the renewing, light-giving Holy Spirit received during genuine, full, experiential, Relational, see, it's relational, epinosis, knowledge of Christ. This is something that is not head knowledge. This is not book knowledge. This is not writings. This is what they had writings, and it was called milk. That Hebrews 4, 11 and 12 says, comes from hearing the directly spoken or heard rhema words. And this is prophetic, prophetic rhema. That's the discernment of the Holy Spirit. These being sharper than any two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is now, right, the way. This is now the way. Little children of God are to learn directly from Him. And there's two blogs for this. Now we'll talk about this in a second. In context, uh, there was a note here. That teachers, who were these? They should have been teachers, ought to be teachers. In context, uh, this is certainly not the law, but instead the solid food of Christ's gospel logos message of the truth. Teachers of the truth, of saving, trusting, relying faith. That's the context that they should have been teachers of. And then... There was a note that's saying the prophetic oracles are utterances of God. The context is the first things is concerning the messianic and new covenant promises used in early church writings 
to convert Jews to Christ. Right? First in importance. And that's what it's talked about. These are the Messianic and New Covenant promises. So all the verses quoted in the book of Hebrews are all pointing to Jesus and his covenant. They're trying to outdo the law teachers who are teaching them verses about the importance of Moses. It says, These were used in early church writings to convert Jews to Christ, used to encourage struggling Jewish Christians to resist the law teachers, used by evangel and evangelist preachers, same word, to elego, or elegos, which is rebuke or convict law teachers. And Paul's already used these words in 2 Timothy 3.16, 4.2, 1 Timothy 5.20, Titus 1.13, 2.15, a whole bunch of verses that only make up 2.6% of the Old Testament. So you want to go look at Logos, Word of God, block topic 6, talks about this. Hebrews 5.12 says, first in time or in the the RK, first in time or importance of the Logion oracles or utterances, see, make up the RK, first in time or importance, Logos message of the Christ, anointed one, Messiah, in Hebrews 6.1. So you see those connections. See, one, see 5.12 and 6.1 link right up together. And the things mentioned in 6.1 and 2 all have to do with Old Testament Jewish doctrines and practices that are preparatory to the New Testament gospel Logos message to Jews. In other words, you got to believe in the resurrection of dead, which the which was a it's just the first things. These are the first things, most most important doctrines of the prophets, right? The prophetic scriptures, the utterances of the oracles. These are the foremost things, right? The most important, first in importance, because if you don't believe in the resurrection from the dead, then you're not going to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Nor are you going to believe that our blessed hope is that when he returns, we are all going to be resurrected from the dead. So they have to solve these real big problems that the Sadducees would not believe in. But the, Fa the Pharisees did. They had arguments in the uh, New Testament between the Sadducees and the Pharisees about the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus got them embroiled in these arguments. So <clears throat> he was dividing and conquering. So although many Christians and churches make these, uh, they say preparatory to the new custom, though many Christians and churches mistake these things that they talk about, I just mentioned one, for church doctrines, right, and practice because they don't know Greek and read verses out of context. They don't even know who the book of Hebrews is written to, right, or the intended of it, audience. So they don't know the intended audience. No lie audience. So they violate almost every rule when they come up with these crazy doctrines. And so now, there was another note that says the milk. Okay, the milk that these Jewish Christians were having to still keep eating, <laughs> drinking. As newborn Jewish Christians, that's what the Old Testament prophetic oracles are Utterances about Christ were. That's what they were, right? As Messiah. So, and then there was a note that was important here too, is the solid food. What is the solid food in context? It's of the gospel logos message and the Holy Spirit's means of revelation. Now through discernment, not through rote learning of the law as with ABC writings and rules to strictly control children. So that this is what it was, and strictly control the Jews as little children. So it, we saw this in the previous um, part <coughs> one, that the law was like a prison guard. A sentinel, and 
it was like a hired servant that was to keep strict watch, keep them boxed in, boxed in, keep <laughs> boxed in, keep the children boxed in, keep them from getting out of place. They were hired servants to make sure they went to school back, uh, to school and back, and that they did what they were told to do, that they ate their lunch, that they um, they were safe, uh, it guarded them, and they had to follow all these strict rules. That's what the Old Testament writings are all about, ABCs. But they're common to every religion. They try to control people, keep them guarded, protect them from the outside world, yes, but through these real strict rules, do this, don't handle this, don't touch this, don't, you know, it's taste this, whatever. And it's just these strict rules. Eat your peas <laughs> or I'm going to spank you, right? There's discipline. I'm going to spank you if you don't eat your tea peas. And these servants, and there's three different words used for them, they were given this power. Well, that's, that's the law. And it treated them, it imprisoned them like a guard. So you, I don't think you want to go back to that. And then it says here, there's another note here, that uh, the Logos, unskilled in the Logos message of righteousness. So if you're still on the milk of the Old Testament, you're unskilled. And why is that, he says? The context is, our source of righteousness is Christ, no longer from obedience to the Old Testament law. And then lastly, the relational epinosis knowledge of Christ is where it's all at, through the Holy Spirit. And I have a lot of verses on that, so you can go look at it. So, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a part three here on the reflections and the uh, prayer. We're going to do a, a video on that. So. Thank you for your patience. A lot of information. Watch part one and part two. I hope this really opened it up for you from the original languages. Plenty of notes out there for you to look at this for yourself. And realize that we don't want anything to do with these ABCs. I hope you got that part. And so God bless you. Look forward to your comments on the bottom of this video. It's a community on the bottom of this page and on the bottom of this video. So we can all be encouraged and learn together, it says. Learn and be encouraged together. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 31. We're all learning together and being encouraged. I just started a conversation with one hat. You guys can, it says freedom matters. Oh boy. It talks about freedom a lot. Freedom from this slavery to the law. Freedom from the grama writings. This is not how we are to know God and His will anymore. We're going to see that. It's what it's opening up to. This is not how we do it anymore. He, Paul says, I have a ministry no longer of the Grama writings. For the Grama writings were what imprisoned you. They kept you in this box. All these little writings, right? And they kept you in this box. And they controlled you. And they imprisoned you. And they guarded you. And they controlled you, right? But we're not having a ministry of that any longer. We are the letters. Christians are now the epistles, the handwritten writings of God. So where are the other writings of God? If we've replaced them, do, I, this is really revolutionary. The Holy, He says, now we have a ministry of the Holy Spirit who writes grapho on human hearts. Grapho. What is grapho? Scripture. <laughs> Grapho is the verb. Grapho is the noun. The Holy Spirit is graphoing in you, no longer by what? On stone or by what? Ink or pen? Pen and ink? No, by the Spirit on tablets of human hearts. Wow, right there, right on the tablets of human hearts. We are the letters, the epistles, the personal handwriting of God to the world. That's why Jesus says, now you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, right? That's what he told Christians. I'm in you. <laughs> so greater things. And somehow the church went into dogma. And you can see this in church history. When they lost their connection to the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, if you do not abide in me, <laughs> then you cannot produce the fruit of God. 
You can go into this for me, for me, for me thing. And that's exactly what Catholicism did. By 220, 200, 225 AD, everyone, all the scholars know this is early Catholicism. Early Catholicism. There's a German term for it. But you can see it in the writings. I read them all. Dependence on yourself. Right? Might and power, Zechariah 4, 6, no longer by my spirit. And then they start despising the gifts of the spirit, despising the miracles of the spirit, quenching the Holy Spirit. Instead of pursuing all those things, Paul said, go for it, he says. They start despising them. And they start forbidding the speaking of tongues. And so many Protestant churches have done the same thing. And they have quenched the Holy Spirit. And they say they're doing this based on some kind of scholastic understanding. Well, I can guarantee you, I pulled on that string big time because I was on the, edit, on the other side. I didn't believe in any of it until I searched it out thoroughly. I mean, go look at those pages on prophecy. Go look at the page on tongues and interpretation. I, I looked at every single little bit of Greek and every single thing in history. So... Something went wrong because I, I scoured it and it came out really clear. So I think you either love the truth or you want to stick with your pet doctrine. I love the truth. I want to know the truth because the truth will set you free. I, I don't care about pet, dro but pet doctrines. You know, I've been in 15 music ministries. They all have pet doctrines. Which ones are you going to choose? They all believe they're absolutely right. How many people really do the homework? Not very many. So don't be, don't be a sucker born every minute, P.T. Barnum. Don't be one of them. 900 Bibles, which one are you going to believe? 6,000 churches, which one are you going to believe? <laughs> they all say they're, they're, they're the right one. <laughs> they really do. So don't go there. Jesus Christ is the right one. God bless you.